How Coffee Came to Vienna, a glimpse by William H. Eukers. The romantic adventure of Franz George Kolschitsky, who carried a message to Garcia through the enemy's lines and won for himself the honor of being the first to teach the Viennese the art of making coffee, to say nothing of falling heir to the supplies of the green beans left behind by the Turks. Also, the gift of a house from a grateful municipality and a statue after death. Affectionate regard in which Brother Hart Kolschitsky is held as the patron saint of the Vienna Cafecida. Life in the early Vienna cafes. A romantic tale has been woven around the introduction of coffee into Austria. When Vienna was besieged by the Turks in 1683, so runs the legend, Franz George Kolschitsky, a native of Poland, formerly an interpreter in the Turkish army, saved the city and won for himself undying fame with coffee as his principal reward. It is not known whether, in the first siege of Vienna by the Turks in 1529, the invaders boiled coffee over their campfires that surrounded the Austrian capital, although they might have done so, as Selim the Ferns, after conquering Egypt in 1517, had brought with him to Constantinople large stores of coffee as part of his booty. But it is certain that when they returned to the attack, 154 years later, they carried with them a plentiful supply of the green beans. Mohammed IV mobilized an army of 300,000 men and sent it forth under his vizier, Kara Mustafa, Kuprili's successor, to destroy Christendom and to conquer Europe. Reaching Vienna July 7, 1683, the army quickly invested the city and cut it off from the world. Emperor Leopold had escaped the net and was several miles away. Nearby was the Prince of Lorraine, with an army of 33,000 Austrians, awaiting the succour promised by John Sobieski, King of Poland, and an opportunity to relieve the besieged capital. Count Rudiger von Starhemberg, in command of the forces in Vienna, called for a volunteer to carry a message through the Turkish lines to hurry along the rescue. He found him in the person of Franz George Kolschitsky, who had lived for many years among the Turks and knew their language and customs. On August 13, 1683, Kolschitsky donned a Turkish uniform, passed through the enemy's lines and reached the emperor's army across the Danube. Several times he made the perilous journey between the camp of the Prince of Lorraine and the garrison of the governor of Vienna. One account says that he had to swim the four intervening arms of the Danube each time he performed the feat. His messages did much to keep up the morale of the city's defenders. At length, King John and his army of rescuing Poles arrived and were consolidated with the Austrians on the summit of Mount Kallenberg. It was one of the most dramatic moments in history. The fate of Christian Europe hung in the balance. Everything seemed to point to the triumph of the crescent over the cross. Once again Kolschitsky crossed the Danube and brought back word concerning the signals that the Prince of Lorraine and King John did give from Mount Kallenberg to indicate the beginning of the attack. Count Starhemberg was to make a sortie at the same time. The battle took place September 12th, and thanks to the magnificent generalship of King John, the Turks were routed. The Poles here rendered a never-to-be-forgotten service to all Christendom. The Turkish invaders fled, leaving 25,000 tents, 10,000 oxen, 5,000 camels, 100,000 bushels of grain, a great quantity of gold, and many sacks filled with coffee, at that time unknown in Vienna. The booty was distributed, but no one wanted the coffee. They did not know what to do with it, that is, no one except Kolschitsky. He said, if nobody wants those sacks, I will take them. And everyone was heartily glad to be rid of the strange beans. But Kolschitsky knew what he was about, and he soon taught the Viennese the art of preparing coffee. Later, he established the first public booth where Turkish coffee was served in Vienna. This, then, is the story of how coffee was introduced into Vienna, where was developed that typical Vienna café, which has become a model for a large part of the world. Kolschitsky is honoured in Vienna as the patron saint of coffee houses. His followers, 
united in the guild of coffee makers, Café Cedar, even erected a statue in his honour. It still stands as part of the façade of a house where the Kolshitsigasa merges into the Favoritengasa, as shown in the accompanying picture. Vienna is sometimes referred to as the mother of cafés. Café Sachet is world-renowned. Tarte à la Sachet is to be found in every cookbook. The Viennese have their jours every afternoon. When one drinks coffee at a Vienna café, one generally has a kipful with it. This is a crescent-shaped roll, baked for the first time in the eventful year 1683, when the Turks besieged the city. A baker made these crescent rolls in a spirit of defiance of the Turk. Holding sword in one hand and kipful in the other, the Viennese would show themselves on top of their redoubts and challenge the cohorts of Mohammed IV. Mohammed IV was deposed after losing the battle and Kara Mustafa was executed for leaving the stores, particularly the sacks of coffee beans, at the gates of Vienna. But Vienna coffee and Vienna kipful are still alive and their appeal is not lessened by the years. The hero Kolshitsky was presented with a house by the grateful municipality, and there, at the sign of the blue bottle, according to one account, he continued as a coffee house keeper for many years. This, in brief, is the story that, although not authenticated in all its particulars, is seriously related in many books, and is firmly believed throughout Vienna. It seems a pity to discredit the hero of so romantic an adventure. But the archives of Vienna throw a light upon Kolshitsky's later conduct that tends to show that, after all, this Viennese idol's feet were of common clay. It is said that Kolshitsky, after receiving the sacks of green coffee left behind by the Turks, at once began to peddle the beverage from house to house, serving it in little cups from a wooden platter. Later, he rented a shop in Bischofhof. Then he began to petition the municipal council that, in addition to the sum of 100 ducats already promised him as further recognition of his valour, he should receive a house with goodwill attached, that is, a shop in some growing business section. His petitions to the municipal council, writes M. Berman, are amazing examples of measureless self-conceit and the boldest greed. He seemed determined to get the utmost out of his own self-sacrifice. He insisted upon the most highly deserved reward, such as the Romans bestowed upon their Curtius, the Lacedaemonians upon their Pompilius, the Athenians upon Seneca, with whom he modestly compared himself. At last, he was given his choice of three houses in the Leopoldstadt, any one of them worth from 400 to 450 gulden in place of the money reward that had been fixed by a compromise agreement at 300 gulden. But Kolshitsky was not satisfied with this, and urged that if he was to accept a house in full payment, it should be one valued at not less than 1,000 gulden. Then ensued much correspondence and considerable haggling. To put an end to the acrimonious dispute, the Municipal Council in 1685 directed that there should be deeded over to Kolshitsky and his wife, Maria Ursula, without further argument, the house known at that time as 30, now 8, Heidgasse. It is further recorded that Kolshitsky sold the house within a year, and after many moves he died of tuberculosis, February 20, 1694, aged 54 years. He was courier to the emperor at the time of his death and was buried in the Stephansfreithof Cemetery. Kolchitsky's heirs moved the coffee house to Donostrand, near the wooden Schlagbrücke, later known as Ferdinand's Brücke Bridge. The celebrated coffee house of Franz Mosse, d. 1860, stood on this same spot. In the city records for the year 1700, a house in the Stockholm Eisenplatz Square is designated by the words Alvo das erste Kaffeegewölbe. Here was the first coffee house. Unfortunately, the name of the proprietor is not given. Many stories are told of Kolshitsky's popularity as a coffee house keeper. He is said to have addressed everyone as Bruderherz, Brother Heart, and gradually he himself acquired the name Bruderherz. A portrait of Kolshitsky, painted about the time of his greatest vogue, 
is carefully preserved by the Innung der Wiener Kaffeesieder, the coffee makers' guild of Vienna. Even during the lifetime of the first Kaffeesieder, a number of others opened coffee houses and acquired some little fame. Early in the 18th century, a tourist gives us a glimpse of the progress made by coffee drinking and by the coffee house idea in Vienna. We read, The city of Vienna is filled with coffee houses, where the novelists, or those who busy themselves with the newspapers, delight to meet, to read the gazettes and discuss their contents. Some of these houses have a better reputation than others because such Zeitung's doctors, newspaper doctors, an ironical title, gather there to pass most unhesitating judgment on the weightiest events and to surpass all others in their opinions concerning political matters and considerations. All this wins them such respect that many congregate there because of them and to enrich their minds with inventions and foolishness which they immediately run through the city to bring to the ears of the said personalities. It is impossible to believe what freedom is permitted in furnishing this gossip. They speak without reverence not only of the doings of generals and ministers of state, but also mix themselves in the life of the Kaiser, Emperor himself. Vienna liked the coffee house so well that by 1839 there were 80 of them in the city proper and 50 more in the suburbs. <laughs>